I do have an agenda addition under 6.5 and an in-camera item, land and development policy. Okay, we'll put that under 6.5. We'll also add a couple of motions to ratify attendance at meetings under 2.2, .2, unfinished business or business arising. Any other additions? If not, a motion to accept the agenda. So moved. Councilor Bigger is moved. All in favor? Motion is carried. Minutes were circulated and are part of the package from the November 5th Council meeting. Did anybody see any? Errors or omissions? If not, a motion to approve. Move to accept as circulated. Councillor Armstrong has moved. All in favor? Motion is carried. <coughs> I'll now move that the process for the Wheatland County Council meeting as it pertains to the scheduled public hearings will be as follows. Public hearing, first reading, then consideration for first readings of bylaw for those public hearings that have been closed. I further move that the above process will take place with the absence of resolutions to go into and out of council before and after each public hearing. All in favor? Motion is carried. I'll call the public hearing for bylaw 2019-22 to order. Good morning. Good morning. So this is the public hearing for bylaw 2019-22 to redesignate about 0.29 acres within the southeast 72325 west of the 4th from agricultural general to country residential district and to redesignate 0 0.79 acres within plan 001 2255 block 1 from country residential district to agricultural general district as shown on the board there. Um, so these parcels received conditional approval for a boundary adjustment subdivision on July 9th this year. And we they've met all but one condition so far. Um, one of those conditions was to apply to redesignate the land within the boundary adjustment. So that's why you're seeing this application. Um, the application generally aligns with the objectives and goals and policies of the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, Regional Growth Management Strategy and Municipal Development Plan all of which speak to maintaining and supporting agricultural land base within the region. Conflict between the land uses isn't likely as the configuration um, has been pretty similar for the last several years. Um, and the existing and proposed land uses will continue to align with the proposed land use districts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Consideration of further readings? What's the reason oh, for, yeah. through the chair, what's the reason for s splitting that up to country residential and a general and not leaving it all as country residential? Through the chair, there was a boundary adjustment. So the top portion kind of outlined in yellow used to be agricultural general. Um, and then with the boundary adjustment where they took that portion into the, basically the house property, um, it needs to be redesignated to country residential in order to align with the rest of the parcel. And then that bottom strip there, the property line was shuffled upwards. Um, and so that's, it's basically they did the boundary adjustment to align with what the existing boundary lines are of the yard because they were selling the property. So in order to make that sale, they just had to adjust everything. And this land use bylaw amendment is just kind of following that to make sure the land use of each parcel is, um, congruent yeah I understand that I'm just curious as to why they're kinda, all those I guess it follows it was a condition of the subdivision yeah you can and see what's going to happen there what prior to consideration of first reading if there's no further questions or discussion I will close the public hearing Consideration of further readings. I'll move second reading. Councillor Custer has moved second reading. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? 
Opposed? You okay? Motion is carried. Call the public hearing to order. Oh, sorry, third reading. Third, I'll call third reading. Councillor Bigger has moved third reading. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Now we'll call the public hearing to order for bylaw 2019-25. Good morning. Good morning again. Can you just confirm that the circulation was done appropriately? The circulation was done appropriately, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Scooch down. There we go. Okay. So this public hearing is for bylaw 2019-25 to redesignate 128.74 acres of plan 0813350 Block one, lot one, from agricultural general to industrial district. Um, the subject parcel is up on the screen there, just next to the Galician Sewage Lagoon, um, just off of Highway 1 and Highway 901. So staff was directed to investigate and locate <coughs> county owned parcels that could be pre zoned to industrial general as part of a pilot project to increase industrial activity in appropriate areas of the county that do not detract from areas already identified and approved area structure plans. The purpose of pre-zoning certain parcels is to attract and accommodate industrial growth by removing perceived barriers, such as processing timelines for approvals. So the following criteria were used for selecting parcels for this project, anything over 80 acres and within a mile of a highway or rail line. So based on the criteria above, three sites, um, they were attached to the package, were initially selected for council's consideration. However, after further research and analysis, two of the sites were removed from consideration as one of them contained a gravel pit that was planned for future expansion, and the other site contained a rec reclaimed gravel pit that hadn't been issued a reclamation certificate just yet. Um, so that left this site here as the only site. It's adjacent to the Gleeshan Sewage Lagoon, and it is currently used for effluent discharge. There's strict regulations from the provincial government regarding municipal wastewater that includes soil considerations, or sorry, soil conditions, drainage, and crops that are permitted to grow on the site. Um, so some key considerations for the site three selection. Um, it's currently the effluent discharge for the Gleeshan Lagoon. Um, it's used as a pivot irrigation system. Staff has reviewed the suitability of this site for future industrial development and has determined that it meets the objectives and criteria for pre-zoning industrial sites. Um, however, the following items will need to be addressed should industrial development proceed on the site. So the entire parcel is required to safely and effectively dispose of Gleeshan's effluent. Um, so if the development occurs on the site, the county will need to explore an alternative site for discharging the lagoon, um, which will require an AEP approval. Um, and the parcel is also currently leased for agricultural operations. Uh, the lease expires October 14th, 2023. Um, even if it is rezoned to industrial general, the person, like the leaseholder, is still able to continue their ag operations. Uh, no studies were obtained for this parcel. Typically, staff would request a groundwater assessment or a private sewage disposal system report with a redesignation application, but the intent is for this parcel to be fully serviced with water and wastewater, and so the reports were deemed unnecessary. The first reading was granted on October 15th this year, um, and the pilot project generally aligns with the South Saskatchewan Regional Plan, the Regional Growth Management Strategy, and the Municipal Development Plan. And though it would be converting agricultural land, the land could still be used for agricultural purposes until a developer submits a proposal. It aligns with the economic policies of these documents, um, and any proposals would need to ensure they align with the biodiversity and uh, ecosystem function policies as well. So staff did receive several comments from ex, um, internal departments regarding the proposed redesignation site. Um, so the concerns raised were the existing lease for the operation, agricultural operations, and the impact the development would have on the affluent discharge, which we've just discussed. Um, and I didn't receive any written comments from landowners nor Siksika, um, though I did receive several calls kind of asking about what the project was about, which I explained to the, to the landowners. Um, yeah, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, well, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I'm going to ask it anyways. I'm surprised that Siksika didn't have some comments on it. 
now if this, this gets redesignated and we move forward with development in there, will they have the opportunity to stop what's going on in there if it's, desi if it's a designated operation? Saying that they had no chance to, to, to have them put into the public hearing. Uh, through the chair, or through the Reeve, rather, sorry. Um, in terms of stopping development, um, there's always a chance for public input as part of the provisions of the Municipal Government Act. Um, so any adjacent <clears throat> um, adjacent property, landowner, what have you, uh, within a certain uh, radius has the ability to submit uh, public comments on any application. But in terms of stopping development, there is no um, opportunity to stop development if any development were to take place on this particular we've got, parcel. We've got good documentation that they were circulated. Through the Reeve, yes, there is. Right. If this land is... I didn't hear myself. If this land is redesignated, will it, the continued use be uh, for affluent discharge be allowed on it? It would be yes. Yeah. Okay. And another question. If, uh, if an opportunity arose for this land for a different use, how long would it take to get another site prepared and approvals done, pivot move for the affluent? It may take a few years, um, so we would need to determine the the distance we would be willing to pull the the piping from the sewage lagoon to an, to another site. Um, we would need to approach those landowners to ask them if they'd be willing to sell their parcel to us. Um, we would need to test the soil to make sure that it can handle this, the effluent. Um, then we would need to apply to Alberta Environment and Parks to get uh, approval to use that site. Um, and then of course we would need to purchase the property. Um, so it would, we don't have any concrete numbers. Um, it's been several years since we last had to obtain an effluent discharge site through AEP. Um, but our, our best estimate is that at least two years through AEP um, and unsure about how long it would take for negotiations with landowners. I may just add um, to council, um, as part of this initiative to get ready for any development throughout the county, um, as committed through council, um, if there is any direction that council may provide to staff at some point or another uh, with regards to any site, maybe this one in particular, to start any work that may be deemed necessary, I would encourage council to um, let us know through um, any direction that you may have at some point. Thanks. Any other questions or discussion? If not, I will close the public hearing for bylaw 2019 25. Consideration of further readings. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll move that uh, bylaw 2019 25 be given second reading. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. I'll third move third reading. reading. Uh, any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. I'll uh, move that staff investigate. Uh, Alternative site for affluent discharge for pollution. Any questions or discussion? So maybe to bring a like a plan back or an RFD back. Investigate a site. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Through the Reeve, just for clarity, do you have a specific date when you'd like? Um, an RFD or a report back, Councillor? Whenever you have information. 
Okay, no, as soon whenever as you get it done. Sounds good. Any other questions? Just not two years. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor of the motion? Motion is carried. We'll move to bylaw 2019-34. There's no public hearing. It's just a, an amendment. Well, uh, it's a new bylaw. It will repeal the previous fire bylaw, but it's just amending the clause on membership. Uh, good morning, Council. Uh, yes, that's correct. So at the previous Council meeting, there was a request to amend the current fire board bylaw and that was to include uh, a representative from each of the villages. So uh, a representative from Hazar, a representative from Rockyford, and a representative from Standard. So this is just administration following through on that uh, request from council. Any questions or discussion? I move first reading. Councillor Wilson has moved first reading. Any questions? All in favor? Oh, oh. sorry. A question. question. Uh, Number 3.5, I'm thinking I will, wouldn't mind seeing that 3.5 omitted because most of the people on the board are firefighters and I don't, I've never been informed of why it is preferable not to be a fireman to be on the board. I don't know what, what the reasoning was. So if somebody can tell me what the reason is, I'm okay with it. Otherwise, I'd just assume, because most of them are gonna need permission to be on the board, because there is nobody else from these associations. They're all firefighters. So I would like to see that omitted too, or amend the, the bylaw. It's a friendly Straight amendment. It. A friendly amendment. So we'll consider the fire by law with 3.5 struck. Yeah. It really doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't hold any water anyways because originally it was where uh, the, the, the wording was members of the fire board shall not and we changed that to where possible so it doesn't so having it in there really doesn't do any good anyways. So I don't have an issue with yeah, okay. pulling it out of there completely. I agree with Councillor Kester. I didn't find that we had a strong rationale for its inclusion initially. So, discussion. It's a friendly amendment. We can just still go ahead and vote on first reading them. So, there's a motion on the floor for first reading. Any further discussion? So, first reading as amended. Mm -hmm. Doesn't change the intent, so it's not even a friendly amendment. It's just. We're just removing that. Just remove it, yeah. yeah. It, would have, it would have to state as amended. In yeah. As for, for sure, because yeah. it's... The uh, amendment is that it's removed. Yeah. Yeah. Any further questions? All in favor of the amended bylaw? Carried. Second reading? Also move. Councillor Bigger has moved. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Permission to grant third and final reading. So moved. Councilor Armstrong has moved. Discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried unanimously. Third reading? I'll move. Councilor Kester has moved. Any? Final questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you. My reports included in the package. Oh, I think I just skipped, sorry. I will go to 2.2 unfinished business or business arising, ratify attendance at meetings. We'll go. Councillor Kester, Councillor Baker. Okay. Uh, there was a fire mediation meeting at uh, the Reeve and myself attended November the 6th. And uh, 
passed that uh, there was on November the 12th, Wheatland Housing had a meeting on the 13th early in the morning, which was, <coughs> maybe it was the 12th, I'm not sure. It was on the Monday. The meeting was early in the morning, Tuesday of the RMA. So we went and were asking for an overnight stay on the Monday night and related expenses. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Councillor Bigger. Uh, yes. Um, the Reeve and I attended the FCSSAA in Edmonton this last weekend, a conference. It was two overnight stays, and we'd like to ratify that. Good. Any questions? Sorry, that was for both. Yes. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. My report's included in the council package. Just a couple of things I'll highlight. The IDP meetings with the villages have been going really well. We've had some good discussions and are, have a plan in place to finalize the Rocky Ford and Hazar ones and Standard will be meeting tonight. The fire mediation meeting uh, went quite well again. We're making good progress. Uh, the beginning of RMA, we had some a couple of good meetings with the Growth Management Board Rural Caucus. Some really good discussion. Some of council was there as well, um, particularly hearing about kind of the capital's perspective on progress that the Growth Management Board has made over their nine years of history and some of their frustrations as well. There was also a good Mayors and Reeves meeting uh, with some really good discussion there as well, particularly around some of the resolutions that were coming forward and around FCM. RMA went really well. Uh, we had some, as you're all aware, excellent meetings uh, with the ministers and their staff. We also had a good meeting with FCM and I have had some follow-up since then uh, that I'll be bringing back to council as well. I did attend the Alberta Rural Development Network AGM showcase in Leduc on my way home from uh, RMA and it was really good. ARDN is a kind of a cooperative of uh, I think it's 13 post-secondary institutes. I don't have the number in my report. I think it's 13. So it's a lot of students um, that are working on different issues in the province and doing pilot projects and that kind of thing. And they're doing some really interesting work around several issues with a particular rural lens. Uh, we hosted our Marigold Library meeting the board meeting in Carsland, so it was really nice to have that in our municipality. Did have a couple of meetings related to broadband and dark fiber, and we're continuing to make progress on that. The tour to Rocky Mountain GTL was really interesting. It, I'm really proud that we have that kind of innovation happening in our municipality. At CMRB, just to highlight, so the IREF challenge that uh, had been tabled at our last meeting was tabled again to the January meeting in order to provide for potential amendments to be considered by Calgary Council that Calgary thinks may potentially result in the challenge being withdrawn. Q3 actuals and the budget were approved. And Deputy Reeve Clausen and I had a good meeting with the Town of Strathmore Mayor and, C and our CAO and the Town of Strathmore CAO. And uh, we discussed recreation funding, crisp funding, and Wheatland Housing Management Board. So it was a really good, I thought a positive meeting. Um, and went very well. 
Does anybody have any questions regarding my report? If not, I will move to accept. All in favor? Motion is carried. Deputy Reeves report. Good morning. <clears throat> so highlight of my report would have been, <clears throat> pardon me, would have been the RMA Fall Convention in Edmonton. We had a really good meeting with uh, Minister Nixon about composting and, and uh, I felt it was very, uh, very positive. Hopefully it has some follow through on it. Um, I know, uh, I think there has already been some contact back from AEP through um, our CAO about some of the things that we had mentioned, so. And uh, what else? The BRBC board meeting, I was asked, I'm an alternate for that board, so I wanted to get up to speed of what happened there. It was really interesting. Um, the more environmentally sensitive side of water, it's really interesting to sit there on the, for CMRB servicing and it's all about water and then you, you, the other side of the coin is they want to protect that water so it's a real fine line. There's a lot more issues in that river for sure. So, and that's about it. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, in our meeting with Minister Nixon, he had made a comment or an ask maybe even that uh, Wheatland County would uh, draft up a new uh, code of practice or have, and we would uh, get a hold of our surrounding municipalities and, and get them to approve it too. Has there been any work? Are we considering doing that? Or? I believe um, the CAO is already on that Maybe with not. our consultant okay. as well. Um, yes, through the chair, just for clarification. Um, so the request was for a white paper on just some uh, just compost related activities. Um, so we have uh, reached out to get uh, Don't think it works. some people to help us with that as well. Uh, so that is underway. Uh, that just started on Monday. Um, we're getting legal counsel to help us with that. And they're also uh, reaching out to Dr. McCartney, who has also assisted the county in previous matters related to compost. And then uh, I've also had another contact from the city of Calgary as well that was provided to me as well uh, to reach out to them as well. So it, it is underway. Um, okay. We were just kind of working on other uh, issues with uh, the compost facility prior to that one starting. So, okay, good. Thank um, you. I'll move my report as information. Any questions or discussion? Further questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. Division one report. Actually, can you move to the other divisions? Sure. Uh, Division three report. Okay. Um, Chamber of Commerce is having a, a Best of Business Awards, a night in Venice. So that will be in uh, January. I'll have more information this week. Um, really enjoyed RMA this year. Feel like we were getting some things done finally. Only took a couple years. Um, Wademsa negotiations, very interesting. <laughs> Union ne negotiations. Um, yeah. Uh, FCSS conference. Um, very, uh, very nice conference. It, 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 lots of, a whole five, 450 to 500. Um, good doers, all in one room. It was very nice. F felt it felt good to be there. And I'll move my report as read. You'll get to suffer through my synopsis next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hers is always better than what I say. No, oh, that was beautiful. Mine will be painful. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. Division four report. <clears throat> it's tough when you're going fourth and fifth because all the good stuff's taken. <laughs> um, but on November 22nd, um, myself and uh, Councillor Lawson had, had the opportunity to meet uh, Councillor Kara, City of Calgary, um, in regards to Calgary Organics. And what happened and how this all came about was I had invited Councillor Kara to come out to to look at our 
our, our site and it just didn't work into a schedule. So he said, why don't you guys come in? I'll pull a couple people out of from, from their organics division and we'll just have a we'll just have a sit down and discuss it because I said, and and the and the 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 gist of the the reason for the the meeting was I wanted to make sure that the city of Calgary understood that when they make when they they do certain things it affects their neighbors and I wanted to be make sure that they're aware of it and they they are they are aware of what what's going on it's just that. Like everybody, they have cost constraints because they. So the numbers breakdown is they passed a bylaw for organics recycling to keep it out of the dump. So residential, there's about 125,000 tons a year that they generate, and they spend 140 million dollars on a an enclosed composting site at, at on 114th Street, and then they decided that they passed this bylaw that. They're going to do because it works so well with residential that they do organics with commercial, and there's about sixty thousand tons, of, sixty thousand thousand tons a year generated on the um, on the uh, commercial end of things, and that has gone out to gone out to, and that's the one that's affecting everybody in the area, and um, so they with us. Um, know that there's a problem with 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 the composting guidelines so they have reached out and they've offered any expertise they can provide and input on this white paper so this is sort of where that um, where that is all that is all coming from right so um, yeah so it was um, so basically they know that there's a there's there's a problem that they are causing problems to the surrounding communities, and they would like to help us with it. They're not going to rescind their their bylaws so that they take their their stuff inside because they cannot afford to put another probably hundred thousand or a hundred million dollars into another recycling plant. They and was it not? There's some of that black bin recycling is now going to be privatized too. Yeah. So there could be more. They understand that because they're trying to cut trying to cut down their costs, that they're privatizing some of their composting. So that's going to cause us more grief, the surrounding the surrounding communities more grief. So, But they're willing to work with us on it. So it was a, all in all, it was a great meeting. So, and um, um, I think that's the big, like, and that, <clears throat> so that takes care of that. And uh, the, uh, the gas plant tour, that is, that is absolutely, Amazing technology. That yeah. what they are doing there is, is is that they're doing it in our county. I mean, it just, I mean, it, it's going to put a spotlight on on our county. It's nothing but good can come from it. So, don't recognize you. I think uh, everything else has been covered. So, uh, with that, I will. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll answer them. If not, I will move my report. Any questions? Not a question, just a comment. I wanted to say thank you to, to Mr. Eichert for setting that up. It was really good to have a just an informal meeting about what's going on. They also did offer um, in the future a tour of their indoor facility. I think it would be a good point of reference for us since we've toured what we have and what they have as a top of line facility. Um, Asked some questions about could they actually process the amount that's in the code of practice. And the, the biggest thing I got out of there is yes, it can be done but it needs a huge amount of carbon input. So that's your wood chips, not stuff, not other feedstock, but just that is needed to keep that process going. I think that's really important to note because um, if we start, as we move forward with the site, um, they're already saying <clears throat> that they need feedstock to go. And I've asked for clarification on that because I, to me, um, from the experts that I've talked to, they need that carbon and it's not other feedstock. And there's a big clarification there on that. And it can be done. They achieve recognized another site. One of their staff was talking about a site up by Red Deer, up by Red Deer yeah. that uh, is commercial operated, is operated very well. Um, I'd like to actually go see that one too at some point. But it sounds like they can easily do the 20000 a year and no complaints. So, so I, think, I mean, they're very, they have two staff members there that were very knowledgeable about it. I mean, that's their business. So it was really valuable to be able to talk to them. So, thanks again, Tom. 
Just a question: Is feedstock only wood chips? No. What about straw? Feedstock and stuff is like a general that? general classification, okay. and wood chips and carbon would be part of that, as it's stated in the current code of practice. It needs to be separated out because one is one you have to pay for, one you get you make money on coming in. Just a comment. It's nice the city of Calgary is uh, composting the material. It's a little bit consoling to know that they're doing a little bit of it in the city, but just because they have constraints restraints doesn't mean we have to accept it. And uh, just we should keep that in mind. We don't have to take it. We we'll continue the course and uh, and get the place cleaned up. And if it's not. Just stop. They can go someplace else. Take it up to Red Deer. I don't care. But until it's cleaned up, we don't have to take it. They don't have. They have no right or no. I don't know if "right's" the right word to pass their right. cost restraints onto us. Right. If they make a bylaw and they can't fund it themselves then they should maybe rethink their bylaw until they can comment. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Motion is carried. We'll do Division 7 and then we'll come back to Division 1. Thank you. It's on the, <coughs> it's on the server there. And, uh... Oh, sorry. I was going off of... <laughs> This instead of my paper. Well, let's do Division Six first. My apologies. I'm sorry, Ben. I no, I apologize. I should have been looking at my paper, not my council package. I've had, uh... An extremely busy month, and I didn't get my report done on time. At least I'm not the only one. Thanks, Glenn. You always okay. make me feel good. So on the fourth, we had a Wadenza meeting. We had the organizational sit back and uh, a major concern still is our core flex shifting and uh, we've asked for a meeting with uh, the ministers we'll see how that goes on Dellum on the 6th we had a fire mediation meeting uh, it's the second one and uh, there is uh, a strong appetite for a debriefing process to figure out if that letter and concern brief that whole letter and uh, so they can move forward on what's safe practices what's not and, and if we were in the right and all that that would all come out in the debriefing uh, on the seventh we had a, a the Wheatland housing meeting and that was to uh, we've we secured a meeting with Health and Wellness, a John Cabell. That was that meeting I asked for before on the 12th. And uh, we went up before MLA, or the RMA. We had that meeting with him and uh, Corrine, his assistant. And he had some different... It was interesting. It was a very positive meeting. Before we had gotten there, he has already talked to seniors housing and he had uh, initiated, I think he initiated, he helped anyway, do a new assessment of the Calgary region, Strathmore being in particular. There are some of their numbers and their assessment is, they're re-looking at them anyway and some of their houses per thousand and stuff. So we're looking for that to come forward. On the 18th, we had a Wadamza Union meeting. That was its union. Hold on. We'll talk about that some other day when we're done with the with the union, and I'll get done. I debrief everybody on that. 19th, we had an MPC and budget meeting, and on the 20th, there was uh, two from the Wheatland Housing Board, myself and the. Vice Chair, we met with Pat Fuel and uh, 
the mayor of Strathmore. And uh, I guess another board member for Strathmore on, uh, on issues between the Strown of Strathmore and the housing body. Mostly this land thing got, is causing them a lot of grief. We uh, we had a very good meeting, and uh, I'll uh, report on that on, right now. On the 21st, we had a Waters of you know, Wheatland Regional Corporation meeting, and on the 27th, we had a Wheatland Housing Management Board meeting. And one of the noteworthy motions of that meeting was there uh, was a motion that uh, it's worded, I don't have the exact words, it's not a adopted minutes yet, but it's uh, without prejudice that the Strathmore, the current Strathmore municipal site is the preferred site for the new build of the lodge. So that's without pre prejudice, they can't hold us to it. But of the sites that were identified so far, it's probably the best site. So, well, uh, Strathmore asked for that, so they can move ahead with, I think, and they've already done a level two, so the next is a level three. They're going to have to drill and stuff. How that's coming, I don't know. And also at this meeting, the board decided that they should have a communications group. This communications group is under the building committee and this group is uh, basically when any questions come to the board or to the municipalities they can refer them to the communications group and uh, myself being the chair send them to me and I can uh, make sure they are appropriate persons answer them. Uh, we've had a meeting and uh, we we haven't got it developed yet. We're going to make, a, they call it an elevator sheet. So this sheet would uh, say things that the individual board members or councillors that are approved motions, things that are can be communicated easily and anything else is uh, no. We also had on the 27th a building committee meeting and we also after that we had a meeting with our MP Martin Shields who was able to come and we presented to him our new build and he's not as in half. Feds don't have any money per se, but Martin has a wealth of information and names being in the municipal world as long as he has. And so we're looking up a lot of them. And on the 29th, I went into the lodge again and uh, had a sh meeting with Vicki, signed checks, and uh, talked about uh, building committee and also went to Wademsa and talked to uh, our operations manager there and got some stats and things so we can present it to the minister and get a presentation ready. That's it. If there's any questions, I'll move my report. I have Wilson. a question, Glenn. Do we have an ask yet from the Wheatland Housing Board for a bill? No. Building committee, we don't have any formal motions, Wheatland Housing. It's not approved yet. A part of our business case, if you look at the business case, there's a, a loan in there, $10 million. Also a mortgage of $42 million. And the next board meeting, I'm thinking we should wait to a board meeting to get some motions on, on some direction for that. So basically the only thing that I can say is uh, the land is without prejudice and the land is not donated. It'll come, it'll be contributions the right word or it's be part of 
So, so the ten million dollars, if you look in our business case, covers land purchases. Don't quote me. Two and a half million architect fees and whatnot. Seven million six, and then some other soft cost movements and stuff. So when we get that done at the board, I can present you with some more solid numbers. That answer enough? Or? Yep. Any other questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. Now we'll go to Division 7 and then back to Division 1. My apologies. No problem. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. It's on the server. And I've got everything in there. I've got a little bit to add from uh, we did. We're not our board meeting for from our solid waste is this month, but we did have an executive meeting. And there's a little information coming out of that. The, uh, I took a little bit of liberty in my convention report and put in there that if they wanted information on it to refer to the Reeves report because she does it all so I don't have to. I did so read that. Thank you very much for doing that. It saved me a lot of. Uh, anyways, the meeting in Brooks with uh, Sewa was a very uh, a very good one. We had to. As it says there, Wheatland Newell and Vulcan reps had to step out of the meeting at the end when they had their in-camera discussion around the, the uh, location and what's going on there. So I have no further information there other than that the work that HDR and the determining of the siting is being followed by our oversight committee to maintain an unbiased decision on the final location. And, uh, I might learn more at the end of the month when we have our board meeting, but as of now, I have no further information on that. With Drumheller Solid Waste, there we're looking at a slight increase this year, probably 1.7 percent. That hasn't been confirmed by the board yet, but that's what we're presenting to them at our budget meeting here this Friday, which is a, a 55 cent increase, and that's outside. That's separate from the transfer issues that we're having. <clears throat> but we do have a report on our transfers, and I've given it to Brian. He's reviewing some of that, and he'll get back to me with his uh, recommendation on that. But out of the out of the first report down to the one we have now, we're looking at the immediate replacement of seven. One, we're hoping to, re <coughs> to move one from one location to another location, drops it down to six. We're taking one out of our reserves, drops it down to five. So we're we're looking at a. Hopefully, uh, uh, some type of a loan proposal for for around six hundred thousand to get it done. So that'll be a separate requisition, and it should be in. It'll be under five dollars, but it'll be more than three dollars for that, depending on how we make that work. So it's not as bad as we first reported, but it's still going to cost us a little bit of money. So, and with that, I'll submit my report. If there's no questions. Any questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. Division one council report. I will use the same excuse Glenn did because it was a busy month. We were moving cows home and I was very busy with other stuff. Um, I'm sure as you guys saw the resolution that we passed in principle was very popular with the media this past month. Um, I have had a chance to talk to numerous municipalities uh, elected officials and MLAs in discussion with our resolution. Um, there was pushback, but I'd say the, f the large majority was very supportive of the resolution, those that I talked to. There was concerns on the timeline and uh, to make sure the government understands that the such referendum on equalization is not tied to a pipeline project. So therefore, I did make some amendments to the resolution. Can I you put, just outline specifically what's changed? Yeah. I put in referendum dates under the recommendations of the C, the oh, province of Alberta used Section 88 of the Supreme Court's decision in that in the Quebec secession reference to remove equalization from the Canadian Constitution, the federal government and every and other provinces must seriously consider the proposal for a constitutional reform endorsed by a clear majority 
on a clear question in the pro provincial ref in a provincial referendum on October 18th, 2021. The same date has been added into C into D to make sure that that is also in stone on October 20 uh, October 18th, 2021, or the next municipal election is why it is that date. And then now I won't release any names, but I spent the weekend at the UCP uh, AGM this past weekend. Met with the majority of rural MLAs. They were hesitant on the timeline to get things done. They don't disagree that there should be a hard wall in the back that says, like, don't push us as far. But with that being said, they did want more time. And municipalities in the north also said the same thing, just because the last two years we know how slow government works, and two years was very, uh, very fast, and I don't think it could have been done. So therefore, I would add two more years to the further there be it further be it resolved to push it to the next provincial election which must be held between March 1st and May 31st of 2023. So it gives four years, well, three and a half to get all the recommendations done. But other than that, and with this being the next council meeting before the deadline for the, uh, for the deadline for the central zone meeting, I would like to adopt it. If there's any questions about anything I've done so far, this or if I've stepped over any boundaries with the media, I've tried really hard not to. It's really hard to keep everything in mind, but I will discuss anything that council is willing to discuss. Um, the biggest, um, uh, comment that I've got that it was a separatist movement. So uh, if you can address that. And I'm glad that um, Amber put in, the Reeve put in her report exactly what a resolution is and that uh, we are not here voting to change the Constitution. <laughs> and um, I wish we had that power, but we yeah. <laughs> and that, And that explains how it works. So if anyone's watching this now to actually go back to her your report and explain. It's a good explanation of how resolutions work and how many times we take resolutions to the government and that this is going to go through a lot of steps. Um, anyway, that was just my comment. Yeah. Uh, just to speak on the separation aspect of it, that was the main thing that was in most of the media. I mean, that's what got the coverage. Uh, that's the, a lot of the questions I was asked. But once we explained that Similar to the firewall that was proposed in 2001, these are recommendations to fix confederation. And as Jason Kenney's point, um, showing in the New Deal panel, it's recommendations to assert Alberta's rights and get a fair deal within confederation. However, if those recommendations aren't implemented, if we cannot acquire a fair deal, within Canada, we have to ask that question to the general public. I mean, Preston Manning at the Manning Centre, at the Manning Centre conference two and a half weeks ago in Red Deer said there has to be an option to bargain with. It has, to, it's just a bargaining tool and I think we, I've, made, I've done my best to make that very clear with most media and I would say once being interviewed, they do, and if you read the actual articles or watch the interviews, once you get into them, you understand that. It's just that main title that is very throws you for a loop. But I have been trying to push ourselves back in to that discussion on fixing confederation. It's maybe just for putting this on the floor to vote. Yep. So just for public record, I will just read what was in my report because I think it's just one more method of communication for people um, if they're watching the video and don't take the time to go into our council package. 
Uh, so this was from our council meeting in November. Council approved the draft in principle. This gives us the opportunity to begin engagement with Wheatland County residents and other municipalities in Alberta. I have received feedback from several ratepayers regarding this resolution. I've heard tremendous support and some questions and concerns. Some comments regarding council's jurisdiction and the appropriateness of a municipal council considering this matter. In order to address this, I think it's important to understand what a resolution is. I'll share some information from the website of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. Resolutions are crucial to RMA's advocacy efforts. They allow members to have a direct role in the advocacy process by identifying priority issues that require actions by other levels of government. RMA uses resolutions to guide our advocacy positions and the issues we prioritize when working with other levels of government or stakeholders. Resolutions are typically directed toward the provincial or federal government and seek changes to legislation, regulations or policy, address funding or program issues, or encourage alternative policy approaches related to a specific rural municipal issue or concern. So resolutions are a formal advocacy mechanism we use as a municipality. Advocacy works to ensure that provincial and federal decision makers, industry, and other relevant stakeholders understand and incorporate rural Alberta's best interests in their policies. I'd also like to clarify resolution process. Following council ratification, resolutions are typically sent through a review process by our district directors, which we have a meeting this Friday, then put out to a vote at our district meeting. If a resolution is supported at the district level, it's brought forward to a provincial, munis provincial rural municipalities of Alberta convention to be voted on. Alternatively, there is a mechanism for independent resolutions to be considered as well. So an example of that would be the cellular 911 levy one that we took forward without district approval, just because of timing. I've also seen some misrepresentation regarding our power as an individual municipality. In terms of municipal power, I'll reiterate this is an advocacy mechanism, currently in draft form, approved in principle. Clearly, a municipality does not have the power to demand changes to the Constitution, nor is the resolution an end run around the legislature, as it may be represented in the media. That being said, grassroots movements can be powerful, and the frustrations of the West need to be addressed in a fair manner. The ideas in Councillor Wilson's proposed resolution are not new. They're based on much of the Alberta agenda, also referred to as the firewall letter, written in 2001 by six conservative Calgary thinkers, including a younger Stephen Harper. The principles in this letter have been brought forward several times over the last two decades, and our provincial government has clearly been focusing on these principles prior to our resolution. I supported approving this motion in principle. By doing so, it gives us the opportunity to engage to hear different perspectives from our rate payers. This is a draft resolution that may or may not be ratified by council. It's possible it may evolve and a different iteration of it may be ratified. Like every issue, I, you don't need to hear the rest of that. Just that we look forward to discussing it and hearing feedback. And just for, just to add on to what I've heard from residents, my residents, Division One residents, I haven't got a response a negative response from this. I have from, uh, we've had that open letter from the lady in Carsland. But for residents in the county, I've heard very little. For every one that I hear, I probably hear 12 in support. I mean, we saw it with the emails sent to the county in support. There's just in the county, we had about six to one in support of the motion. So I just want to make that clear when I say big or small on the issue, I plan to represent my residents and I believe that's what I'm doing. So I will uh, not be voting in favor of this because I think we're stepping over the line a little bit as to what our duties are. I agreed with the resolution in principle to get it out there, let people discuss it, but I don't think we have the right to uh, mandate to the province where they go. I think we, I agree with some of what's in there and I think uh, we could do the same thing by sending a, a, a letter to the province telling them that we agree with the position that they're taking and that we support it. But this one I don't have enough information on all the issues in there and the comments I've been getting from some of my repairs are very mixed. They're either on it or they're on it and some of them are undecided. So. 
I'm, I'll, uh, I'm going to ask for a recorded vote and I'll be voting against it. Uh, I have to agree with Ben. I've gotten quite a few comments on this. Uh, not saying if they're against or not, but it's again that old question being in our lane. That's not what we were elected for. We have MLAs that were elected to, to do this work. When I run for re-election, it was Roads was a big concern, our ambulance was a big concern, New Lodge was a big concern, our bridges, everything, environment was big concerns. That's what we lobby our governments for, not for changes in the Constitution. That's what our MLAs are for, and that's the comments I've gotten from. I can't say just the ratepayers in my division, but multiple ones from across the county. They think we should stay in our lane, do what we were elected to do. And uh, like Ben, I, I can't vote for it. I don't think I had one that agreed that it was our priority. I'm not saying they agreed or disagreed with the meat of the matter, but that's for their MLA to, to talk about. So, yeah. I've struggled with this is with what when this was first proposed I said is this what we're supposed to do as as municipal leaders and what I've come up with is it may be the way you look at it maybe it may be out of our lane but it's a grassroots thing it's it's it, I think it's probably one of the best ways to find out what, what the grassroots of Alberta feels about this. It is, it's been taken on by, by Councillor Wilson. He's, as far as I know, it does not cost the county to this point. This does not cost the county a dollar or a or a or a minute of, of administration time. I believe that this needs to go on to the next layer, onto the next level, to see what the rest of the rest of the municipalities feel. Um, I believe this is actually a legitimate grassroots question. I mean, is it easier to get hold of Tom Eichert when you live in Cheadle or Leela here? And I'll tell you, it's easier to get hold of me. I will answer my phone. I will return your questions. So I think, I think the grassroots accountability, the closer we are to the people, the more important it is. And I don't see it as affecting anything else that I was elected to do. This is just sort of a, for lack of a better word, a side project. I mean, like I said, as far as I know, this has cost the county absolutely no money. Granted, we are, I, I am using my, my soapbox for something that maybe hadn't been thought of before, but I'm not sure that anybody can make the argument that this isn't what we shouldn't be doing. We are being um, constricted by the amount of money that, that's coming into the county, and the reason that's, that's happening is because of these things that are happening out there. We don't have a pipeline. We don't have all this stuff, and we can, we can complain about that as much as we want to our MLAs. But this is coming home to the grassroots people. Our taxes are going to start going up. Our revenues are going down. It's, it, it's not a good position to be in. And we have to make sure that we're telling the powers that to be that there's got to be something else, that there's got to be something. If, it, if, it's, if we go to the next level and we put this forward and my constituents tell me that they don't want me doing this. I will bring that forward. But I have heard none of that. I've heard that this is this is something that needs to be done and it probably should have been done sooner. So I will be voting for for the motion. Any further discussion? I'd just like to close. 
So I didn't have a nice speech typed up this time. Um, I figured I'd try to wing it. That being said, over the last month, not only have I talked to residents, but I've got calls from an 82 year old in Grand Cash. He said, thank you. And that's never happened to a lot of elected officials. Nobody's ever phoned seven hours away and said, thank you for something. And I, I mean, I'd like to ask the question, have we ever had that many email responses in favor of anything? Has anybody actually taken the time out of their day to say thank you or I support what council's doing? I don't think probably in the last 30 years, Ben, that it, you've ever had that. And I'd just like to finish with, we're a municipality. Municipalities don't play politics. Perhaps it is out of our lane. But when we have other municipalities pushing a different agenda that directly affects our jurisdictions, our industry, and our residents, such as Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, when you have the large urban municipalities pushing the leftist agenda, I believe that it is our job to stand up against those other municipalities and push our residents ideologies and beliefs. We have to play the game as much as they are in order to fix confederations so, it, so they don't pull it apart. So I do just have a question. Um, I had asked if references could be added like yes. to where you drew your information. And so I'm just asking if you might consider um, giving two more weeks for council to consider this uh, for references to be added. We do have a meeting, a council meeting December 17th. And I'm wondering if there's any um, appetite from council to do like some more formal public engagement, actually have the resolution um, shared like through our communications department, through our website, social media, with some more um, maybe complete accurate information about what a resolution is, the mechanism, uh, that it's an advocacy piece, um, to other levels of government to kind of fix some of, because there are some misperceptions about what this is and the powers that we have and that type of thing. That would give us a couple of weeks to do some better public engagement <coughs> and then we could fully consider this at our December 17th council meeting. Uh, the dead, I could still take it to our director's meeting on Friday, just we don't bring necessarily formal finalized resolutions to that meeting, but it's more for um, other Reeves to just, or mayors, to consider kind of the, uh, the principles of resolutions. And then we could still have it finalized prior to the January 7th deadline to go to the February 7th district meeting. One of my concerns that I am constantly asking in this role is, is the vocal minority representative of the majority of people? And because we haven't done any formal public engagement, I'm still having a hard time gauging that. I would echo what you said. The vast majority of people I've heard from have been very supportive. There are some very valid concerns, and Ben and Glenn have spoken to a couple of them that I've also heard, and people gravely concerned with what we're doing and, and what it could mean for our country and our nation and things like that. So um, I don't know if you would consider that. Yep. I can bring back the statistics that I pulled. Yeah, like just the references where you bring got them. Bring back a bibliography. Really like bring back. Yeah, I think it's important. And if anybody else has any other like edits or proposed changes, um, even if we could maybe submit those today so that administration would have time. But And this is just an idea. I don't know if council's in favor of it. It would take some administrative time um, in order to do that. But I think the engagement could be worth it. I like the idea because I can't say 100% that I'm doing what my rep what our people I represent want. I've heard from a few. I've heard from some people that aren't as happy about it and are very educated at this higher than I am, and I can't answer their questions. Um, I'd like these people to have a chance to say, ask their questions, and get you know information, the right information, back and forth. I don't think this is something that we need to rush through for sure. Um, it's already out there. You, you know, and I think you've done a really fair job with the media trying to portray what you wanted at the start. I know the media has kind of twisted it sometimes as a separation thing. That was never my intent at this. There's some good questions that need to be answered. Um, 
but yeah, I think definitely some kind of public engagement. Um, how we would we do that? I would see like something on the website and asking. I don't want to have a big town hall meeting or anything like that. But uh, I don't think rushing this is a good thing. It's nice to ask the questions, but who's going to answer them if it's just on the website? So same thing. You want people to ask questions they have to have a place to go for an answer and being this is a council thing do we want to set time aside in a council meeting for for the public to come in or are we just going to have them tick a box you in favor or not in favor i don't know we, we, we got to be specific on our ass too can we invite them to that council meeting I met councils well how I had envisioned was providing a little bit more context and background information with the resolution in terms of what a resolution is um, that it typically does deal with other levels of government in for, for advocacy um, and just around power because honestly like people misunderstood what a resolution could do and I had to really clarify that a lot of people even who initially had concerns not everybody but several people that had concerns after I got through a good fulsome conversation with them um, basically outlining what I had in my report people were more comfortable with what we were doing those that had concerns a lot of people were just a hundred percent in favor of it with no questions they wish we had the power to do what you know what I mean like, so th but there was other perspectives as well and I want to respect that as elected officials we do work under representational democracy so we do have the responsibility to do our best at representing people and that's why i'm requesting just some more engagement so and and i guess in response to your question councillor kester there could be some of that background information that might answer some of the most we could even all kind of pool our the main questions that we've gotten put together maybe an faq or just a background document that could go with the resolution or maybe even well it's probably not appropriate to have it in the resolution because people at RMA understand what resolutions are so but there it could be more than just checking a box it could be provide comments or questions yeah and if there's questions even online or through the newspaper we could have it come through our communications department and answer them we do that with other we've done it with policing we've done a survey on priorities I'm trying to think of other Things we've done sorry paving cannabis we've done different ways of doing engagement just a note too I can think of several times in the last couple of years we've been here where if we hit a sore spot this room fills up fast and we haven't seen that that says something too this is a public meeting anybody can come and be on the agenda at any time and if they're that serious, they could be standing up here presenting. And I, One of my concerns, that though, was that this wasn't on our agenda for today. It wasn't part of the council if we package. Put it on the agenda for sure. For yeah. The seventeenth, perhaps we could have yeah. a number of people show up. And I don't want to say that we're trying to push something through. Nope. I think we need to have that engagement. So, no, that is so long as it's done by the seventh of January. I'm so I'm happy to do. So, that. would you table your motion to the seventeenth? Yes. I will. Okay, and then can we advertise it? We would need. Sure oh, sorry. Was there no motion? There was no motion yet. Oh, sorry. Okay, I thought I you will, had moved. I will plan to. Okay. Bring it back the seventeenth, so long as we advertise it. And it'll be in the agenda package and everything. In its yeah, yeah in the form that we're going right to be considering. The, what is council's thoughts on more formal engagement? And just before, is this the formal one, or do you guys like the first one? Like, just so we, do we want to talk about the form of this and perhaps we fix it now and then present it? Or are you guys good with this one? I'm good with it. Can I tell you at the end of the day? Yep. Yeah, I would like a little more time. I just, I didn't know what form might come back. Yep. So I would like a little bit more time to just consider feedback that I've received so far. And then 
just acknowledging that it could evolve again on the 17th based on if we do more formal engagement feedback we receive between now and then. Clarification then for public engagement. We just want to know what's from our county because this is a national <laughs> issue. Um, I would hate to see our council turn into a media showroom. And that's, I think, so when I was looking at feedback that we've received, I was very much focusing on feedback from our ratepayers because that's who we're elected to represent. So if we can keep it focused on Wheatland County ratepayers, I think, for feedback, I'm not, I, I know you can't control that on a, like a... I like the one that called me the really mean name. I like <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't from the county either. So if you're asking for a comment, you should put forward the motion you're going to be working with so people can comment on that motion. So if this is the one you're going to present with the dates on it, and that goes on asking for comments. And people can comment with their comments, right? They don't point. like the date, they don't like a section, if they don't like any of it, or if they love it all, they can make comment on that. What would be the sense of asking for comment when you don't supply them anything to comment on? Yeah, no, of course, we would need a, a version that would be finalized. So, I mean, we could, well, we've already approved in principle the first one. I don't know if we want to approve this as an amended in resolution in principle again to be released publicly or if we stick with if you need quick access to the original it is in my report so it's just the dates that you've added under cd and further be it resolved yeah which doesn't change the intent so i'm gonna good carry this one on as the one in principle, probably. I'm at council's will. So you're still, have you presented the way you've got it written here, you're still talking about a separation resolution. No matter how you cut it, you're still talking about putting it forward as a, a motion of separation. Oh no, it's your last statement is separation. The last statement states, if the federal government does not deal with these demands in good faith, if they block, hinder, or otherwise prevent Alberta from exercising its right, as outlined above, that the government of Alberta will hold a referendum with a clear question, as defined in the Clarity Act, on the secession of Alberta from the Canadian Conference Confederation during the 31st general election of Alberta, Alberta general election, which must be held between March and May 31st, 2023. Now, I, I don't read that as a separate statement. Personally, and that's personally, I'm sure you do, but that's what it's saying to everybody that's reading it. The, the Clarity Act on the secession of Alberta from the Canadian Confederation. That's what you're asking. Read this whole thing and go through all of it. You're saying that if you don't agree, if they <laughs> don't agree with any of this, thing. that we're asking for separation. I have read the whole th thing. And I know you have, and I'm not saying that you haven't, but I'm saying that that's what's being written. That's what I'm getting. Well, I think about. that question has to be asked if those demands aren't met. But that's not our position. That's yeah. not where we come from. That's from the ones above us that know a little more about what's going on than we don't. We, we can't assume to know more than what the provincial government knows when they're dealing with the, these these things, their backroom discussions, the things that they deal with, it's not called in camera like we do, but when they're in caucus, there's things going on out there, and I support where, where our Premier's coming from, and I support what he's doing, but I do not support separation. Still think on the proper process moving forward is you would table this motion to that date and you would have an opportunity for public comment and you would put that out as a communication to our public on however we do it because right now public can come in on a council meeting and they're not allowed to say anything but if we call it much like a we did for the fire. We asked for public comment, and we got it 
You can do the same here. Table this motion, table the first motion. It has nothing to do with the motion that we said in principle. That motion was to gather comment. Okay, if you want to vote on that motion on the 17th, then table that motion. If not, table this motion. We can't decide here on which motion we're going to do. We don't decide what motions as a group. Thank Somebody you. moves a motion and away you go. I get it. I will move this motion. Uh, I will table a notice of motion. Well, yeah. a don't, don't, don't table it, otherwise it's gone. It's gone. Yeah, a notice of motion. Notice of motion for the Alberta First Resolution on Aim the date. On the December 17th. Can I say a time so we tell people the time? Yeah. Can I start early and say nine and have public hearings after that? That's good. Okay, fine. Nine o'clock at Council Chambers. With the resolution as presented today. As presented today. Sorry. This is a notice of motion? Yes. Yeah. That this be deferred to the December 17th. Council. That it will be voted on on December 17th. I like that. Thanks for explaining. Any questions or discussion? That's a votable motion, is it? Yeah, I was just checking. No matter what happens, thank you guys for at least allowing me to bring it forward because it's been a hell of a ride. It's called free speech. Yeah. And it's a lovely thing. We will take a brief break until 10.30. Call the meeting back to order. I'll move my report as read. Any questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. We'll move to the interim CAO report. Uh, good morning, Council. So on page 90 of your agenda packages, uh, the interim CAO report, uh, just a couple things to note. Uh, so I did this report on November 23rd, and just with some scheduling, I didn't end up attending the WRC meeting. Uh, so in my report, I do have that I did, uh, just to kind of clarify that. Uh, just some other items to note. Uh, the Clooney Fire Hall, so that has been shut down since about July 2018. So just an update, uh, the hall's been cleaned up. We're just working on some other items with their, uh, some electrical items. So we have a, a licensed electrician going in tomorrow to make some uh, quick repairs, but overall the state of the hall is actually very good. Uh, the trucks are back in the hall, the equipment's back in the hall. Uh, we've done some safety reports. It's, it's uh, or, uh, the safety has got a lot better, so that's good. Um, and just some other things to point out. Uh, so I attended the RMA Fall Convention in Edmonton from November 12th to 15th. Uh, did quite a bit of prep work for that. So, um, and I think it paid off at the meeting. Um, we've been working a lot with fire. We did our uh, fire master plan, a kickoff meeting with TSI. So that's underway. Uh, we also did hire an interim fire chief, Vern Elliott. So he's now on staff. Uh, he started on November 18th. So he's done a pretty good job so far. Uh, and then besides that, working on issues with GFL and been working on operating capital budgets. Any questions? Uh, on November 26th, Wheatland Regional Corporation Board meeting in Azar. Uh, so that meeting was in Rockford and I did not attend. So <laughs> okay. my apologies on that. Must have just got the two mixed up. That's okay. probably had his arm. Ryan like, was at the meeting all by himself <laughs> in his arm. <laughs> yeah, that's why no one was there. So <laughs> I know how that feels, yeah. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Any my other questions? Mm -hmm. A motion to accept his information? I'll move. Councillor Eichert has moved. All in favor? Motion is carried. So for the next report, I'm going to get uh, our manager of financial services, Matt Kersiba, to uh, present. He's been doing quite a bit of work in the corporate services department. So uh, yeah, give it to Matt. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Good morning, Council. On page 92 of the agenda, you'll find the corporate and financial services report. 
In regards to assessment, we inspected the new Rocky Mountain Gas to Liquids Plant in Division 3, which has a projected operational date of May 2020. This is expected to have a minimal assessment impact for 2020 property taxes. In regards to finance, MNP LLP was selected as financial statement auditors for Wheatland County. The following dates have been confirmed for the 2019 year-end audit. The interim audit will take place from December 17th, 2019 through December 19th, 2019. The year-end audit will take place from March 2nd, 2020 through March 13th, 2020. And the year-end audit presentation of financial statements to Council will take place at the April 21st, 2020 Council meeting. In regards to human resources, we have, let me scroll here. In regards to human resources, we have conducted annual performance reviews with all staff and are nearing completion. And in regards to information technology, two-factor authentication implementation for Office 365 is underway to increase security. Corey will be reaching out to everyone to get this set up. Excellent. Any questions? I'll move to approve. Councillor Wilson has moved to accept his information. All in favor? Motion is carried. We have an RFD regarding the Community Enhancement Regional Board. Uh, good morning, Council. So on page 94 of your agenda package is uh, the curb board appointment. So there was one vacancy in Division 7 that uh, we advertised out uh, on our website in the uh, Drumheller paper as well. So someone did apply for that, uh, Mr. Cole Kaiser. Uh, so he has applied and admin is recommending that he be appointed for the two-year term. I'll move the recommendation that Cole Kaiser is a representative for one of the representatives for Division 7. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. A request for a property tax penalty reversal. Uh, yes, Council. So on page 96 of your agenda package, uh, the information is there. Uh, the statement that we got from the bank just noted that it was uh, paid after the due date. So in that situation, administration would not waive the fees. So uh, yeah, all the information is there. Council's wishes. Just some background. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to read the letter, but he had suffered from uh, a stroke and um, couldn't get into town. And he phoned me and then I asked for the letter and some information and then um, he asked that we bring it to council so we could vote on it here. I'll move the council not approve the reversal of tax penalties totaling 193.11 on the roll 87.5.1000 and 144.32 on 88.1000 and 125 on 88.14 and 24.78 on 88.15 for 22.76. <coughs> I think the amounts just have to shift to the other the, role, but yeah, that's okay. The, As presented. Presented. Questions or discussion? All in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion is carried. We have an RFD regarding the interim operating budget. Um, good morning, Council. So on page 100 of the agenda package is the unapproved interim operating budget. Um, so just to note, uh, this is the first time that has been brought forward to a Council meeting. However, Council has uh, had two separate workshops on the operating budget. Um, so kind of the historical reason uh, that the County approves an interim budget versus just a, a final budget 
is that this gives the opportunity for administration to update the final budget uh, once all requisitions are received and all the assessment is in as well. Um, so with that, just typically, it's usually done at the first meeting in April, uh, and that's usually when the our biggest requisition, which is the education requisition, is received from the province. Um, so under section 242 and 243 of the MGA, that's really where the operating and all the rules of the operating budget are in place. So administration follows that very closely. Um, so a couple things I'd like to point out just about this operating budget, uh, just for council today. Um, so there's still quite a bit of uncertainty with this operating budget. Um, so a lot of the uncertainties that administration has is the, the potential ad, or assessment change to non-residential and machine and equipment classes, which could decrease Wheatland County's overall assessment. So this could lead to a decrease of approximately 10% of revenue. Um, there's also has been talks from the provincial government as well about moving some of the ARPS, RCMP requisition down to municipal uh, or municipal districts such as Wheatland County. And this is something that we haven't had to pay before. So we still don't have information about that. But now from my readings that this could be something in 2021. So it may not be something that we need to worry about in 2020. Uh, however, something on the horizon. And then there's also potential increases with other uh, requisitions like the education requisition, um, the waste, the seniors housing, uh, and any other requisitions that the county pays. So I'll kind of go over those in more detail uh, further in the, or later in the presentation. Um, so with that decreased assessment as well, what that will mean for the county and our neighboring municipalities and fire associations is that in the curb and crisp, or the crisp curb money, sorry, that would lead to a decrease in assessment which would also result in all of those uh, funds that we distribute out to neighboring municipalities, associations, that could be lower as well. Um, we can't confirm that at, this, at today's date just because we still don't have that information from the province. Uh, and another thing also for council to consider as well is that there's other larger expenditures that could happen throughout the year. Uh, if council's priorities change or something comes up, sometimes we'll just have to spend extra money. So um, that just kind of comes up as things come up. Um, so with that, in the two previous budget meetings that uh, we did discuss these changes as well, so Council has taken, uh, has provided administration directions on cost saving measures. So some of these cost measures or cost savings measures include no increase to cost of living for staff. And what that really is, is to <coughs> re reflect the current economic conditions in the province. Um, reorganizing departments and not filling uh, current organizational chart vacancies and then also modifying existing uh, benefit policies and programs that the county has in place for future sustainability. Um, another kind of key factor that the county has done as well is our total operating or capital budget, sorry, is lower than historical, is significantly lower than it has been in the past. And what that does is just allow the county to kind of pick more, um, prioritize, prioritize their projects better and pick more urgent projects that need to be completed. Okay, so I'll also go through just a little bit of a, a basic budget 101. So when we're trying to balance the budget here, uh, what we have to do is do total revenues plus total transfers from reserves uh, minus total expenditures and transfers to reserves. So that number will equal zero uh, for a balanced budget. And that specific line that we've kind of showed that to council is on page 104 of the agenda package. Um, just the total expenses, less amortization, and the difference is zero. So amortization is included in the expenses, but that's a non-cash expense, so that's kind of allowed on, under the MGA to do it that way. Um, just also for council's uh, information, as council does know, that all the all the revenues and expenditures are separated throughout the throughout the budget. So in all the revenues will start with a one. So all the taxation revenue that is coded one zero zero, so that would indicate a revenue. Also, it has a negative bracket around it as well. And then all the expenditures would start with a two. So those are outflows for the county. Um, just for account coding structure, just for uh, information, what we try to do in every department is we always try to keep those consistent. So all of the department numbers, they're all listed at the very top in the budget summary. 
so anything to do with uh, administration is 1200, assessment is 1214, fire is 2300. Uh, we also try to keep the object code the same as well throughout each department for uh, tracking purposes. So a good example here would be 2100 is wages, um, and that's the fourth string of numbers. So the 2100 would also be wages in administration, the 2100 would be wages in fire, uh, 2100 be, be ways, or wages in planning and development. So those are all consistent just if you're ever searching through the budget. Um, so I'm gonna just briefly talk, talk about uh, the taxation revenue that the county receives. So there are four main classes. There's residential, farmland, non-residential, and machinery and equipment. As I previously, previously discussed, there will be, the province has kind of given us a heads up that there will be an assessment change to the, the whole assessment model. So our indication of what they've kind of told us is that what, that will lead to a decrease of all uh, of those categories for the county. So what, what council has wanted to do is maintain service but not try to totally mitigate that issue through, through raising taxes to the ratepayer. So I'm just gonna go through some of the larger expenditures in the budget. And one thing new that administration has done for the operating budget this year is that we've moved all of the uh, requisitions to the taxation tab. And that's just instead of having them spread out throughout the budget, just to make it more clear for the reader and clear for council administration, just exactly where they are. Um, so just to kind of go through some of the larger um, requisitions that the county pays. So the Wheatland Housing Management Body, um, that bill to us is usually provided by the housing body in March. So what we've done this year is that we've just estimated a, a percentage increase of 3.5%. There is possibility of a new lodge <coughs> potentially being created and a, uh, potentially a capital contribution from the county. Um, still, that can be planted in the future, so that's not included in the operating budget. So just a, clear, uh, just a question for my clarification and curiosity. They can't requisition capital building funds, can they? Um, no. So there's kind of two things that the, the board can do. Um, so under the Housing Act, under Section 7, it's, it talks about what they can actually requisition us for. And what it is is a previous or uh, the previous year's deficit. Um, so that can be done, I believe it's up to March 30th. Mm -hmm. If I'm, I, sorry, I don't, I don't have that section memorized. And then the second, the <laughs> second one is <laughs> for uh, an existing reserve that's established. So under Section 21 of that Housing Act, uh, they can do uh, that. That's where they establish reserve, and it's, it requires ministerial approval. So for a new reserve, they have to go through that measure. So I don't believe they have one. The, the housing board has a reserve set up for a capital. However, that doesn't stop the county from making a resolution or making a contribution outside of that. So that the, the, short, the short answer is no, they can't force us into it, but th there is opportunities, other ways to avenues to do it, so. Thank you. Um, so the education requisition, that was the one I was kind of talking about before. Um, that one was kind of just different this year uh, in our actuals, just because there was a, a one-year program that was uh, put forward after the April requisition that relieved shallow gas certain wells off of uh, a certain percentage of their taxes. So that actual is kind of just a lot different this year than it has been in previous years. So what we did with that one is that we just said over the previous year's budget, we added 2.5% as an estimate. Uh, so that's the 10 million, 10.6 million. Uh, the dip requisition, what we did was we just increased that as well by 3.5%. Again, just an estimate, we'll get that, uh, the dip requisition bill at some point in the year, or in the new year. Uh, the fire dispatch one, that's what EMSA, uh, I believe they're keeping it the same. If not, we'll find out. I'm fairly confident they are, though, just in discussions with them. Uh, the WFCSS requisition, we've just increased that 2%. Um, I'm unsure, just uh, I haven't reached out to them. But uh, yeah, it could be that. And then for the drum heller solid waste one, we actually increased this one about 10%. Um, so as Councillor Armstrong alluded to earlier in his uh, division report, that the, the actual increase for the drum heller solid waste may be just under 2%. However, there is that issue with all the trans stores that are outdated and need replaced. 
so what I've done is kind of just lump that number into there. So that could be a part of the replacement program. But until we kind of get firmer numbers, then we won't really know. Uh, and then finally, the library, uh, the Marigold Library requisition. So that bill comes in usually about February. So, okay. Um, so, and just to kind of go over some of the, some of the larger <coughs> operating expenses that the county has. So our total salary and wages. Um, that's for all the employees that we have. So uh, seasonal, full time, uh, full time hourly, and full time salary. So that number is on page 105 of your agenda package. Um, it's actually gone down from previous year. And the reason for that is that um, it's gone down about 350,000. And what that is is just not filling previous vacant positions and just uh, kind of retaking a look at administration and just seeing where we can find efficiency. So that's always good. Um, So, and a lot of the other expenses too, so the next three I'm gonna talk about are the fire funding, the curb funding, and the Chris funding. So those are just previous years that we've just kind of left in all as estimates until we receive information about our non-residential and um, machinery equipment assessment. We haven't changed them. We kind of just left them as is. Um, but once we get that information from the province, if it does come for this year's budget, then we'll adjust those numbers at that point. Just a... Um, question on that the library funding will be affected by the M&E as well um, so the way it kind of works now is that the Chris funding is 0.1 of a of a mill of all classes so what that is is uh, residential farmland non-residential and M&E and then I believe the way the program works is that it's that and that is about 430,000 what it was last year and then they take out about 50,000 for the library uh, so the library is based on, I believe it's card holders. So I know that total expenditure is about 45,000 a year. Um, so that we haven't kind of went down that avenue of how to fund that library one. Um, so technically it's still on card holders. So the total cur curb would go down, but if the total curb goes down, it might be an avenue to either adjust that funding model for the library or that way. But realistically right now, there's no changes to that. So. Okay, um, so the Crispin fire funding, we did talk about that earlier. I just left the same until we have any um, assessment changes that we get the information, which we're kind of waiting for. Uh, fuel expenses, that one is very difficult to actually estimate um, just because the commodity fluctuates so much in a, any given year. Um, we do get all of our, all of our fuel through RMA, uh, fuel I believe it is, so. Um, we, we leave in an estimate. We're pretty close to last year, actually. Our budget to actual is actually fairly close. Uh, it also depends, too, on like weather-related things, like how much the trucks are out and other projects kind of going on. So, uh, Insurance, that one actually went up quite a bit. Uh, that one was also, that one is RMA kind of gives us a bill. RMA did uh, let us know that that one would be up a bit. Um, so that one did go up. So that one, we kind of budgeted to go up 125000 we have received the bills this year, so that one actually, that budget will be very close. Uh, utilities, that one went up as well. Um, <coughs> and, and that includes internet. So what we've done here at the county so far is that we increased our internet speed currently at the county building. So that was about another 15,000 annually. And then there's potential for us to maybe move to dark fiber as well. So that's also kind of been included in that number. Uh, gravel pit payments, the county, we include this for budgetary purposes. It's in the MGA under section 243. So that uh, annual expenditure has to be included. So right now we're paying for, I believe it's three pits. Uh, and that's going to give us aggregate for a long time. And then the donations to others. I uh, just want to go over this with council, just for your awareness. So in, in under that million dollars, uh, there's going to be the Strathmore Fieldhouse uh, for about 100000 so what that is, is there's a, a $21,000 capital levy that we contribute to annually. And then we also contribute to one third of the operating loss and we have that around uh, 79,000. So uh, the county is also contributing to a Golden Hills uh, Division's gymnasium project. So that's 125,000 a year. So a previous council made that resolution. So that was a, a four year resolution. 
and that will be ending in 2020. So after 2021, that frees up uh, about 125,000. Uh, the county also contributes to Star Ambulance, and I believe it's $2 per capita, so it's about $17,500. Uh, we have a miscellaneous line that we contribute to organizations annually, so that's under the administration tab, that's $72,000. So we've been contributing to Handy Bus and just other miscellaneous organizations, the Christmas Hamper. And What page is that? Line yes, so that is on page uh, 112. And it is just below that blue and then yellow line, then it's the one right below that. So in 2020, we have 72,000 uh, budgeted for that. The bulk of that expense in the past has been the Strathmore Handy Bus. So on, on an annual basis, the county has been contributing 35,000 to them. And then the rest of that, it will come to, there'll be other miscellaneous expenses. The the Christmas hamper, the county usually puts in about 3,300. Uh, there can be also other payments in there. And sometimes it's on cash as well. So when we donate like gravel, for instance, um, to neighboring municipalities or to like an event, all of that gets coded into there as well. And this is another opportunity for council to provide direction to administration. Uh, oh, uh, uh, I should have mentioned that at the very start. Um, so my apologies on that. Mentioned uh, we source our fuel from the RMA. Um, Mike, do you know when you started that? Uh, I believe it was about three or four years ago, I recall. Does the suppliers change much, Mike, or is it pretty consistently? Yeah, uh, through the chair, I'm not aware of, of the, the fine details of it. I, think that I can find out if you like. <laughs> so just further to that line item with the donations I'm trying to I don't see it in my notes but one day in council we had talked about developing like a policy around donations to others and kind of a procedure yes so I don't remember when that was though I believe it was back in September okay. uh, actually oh it could it could have been August or July I believe so we did have that to come back to okay. a planning and priorities it was actually scheduled on the agenda and we oh, just it's ran that out day of time. we didn't get through. Uh, yeah, right. um, it, it is still ready to go, um, so council can hear that. At Maybe in point. the new year we can sure. do another planning and priorities. Um, we were hoping to kind of establish that before um, this budget cycle, but it just okay. ran out of council time, I guess. So, thank you so much. And then the this line as well for that million dollars in there is it maybe not considered a donation, but it's just the the object code that we use is actually the WRC phase three contribution. Um, so that's 100 or 620,000. So that's, uh, that would be under the, the Galician water tab. So, okay. Uh, one other point that I kind of glazed over earlier that I just wanted to bring back to council's attention um, is just the benefits that the county pays. So the county pays for uh, employees that participate in the pension program, LAPP, uh, health and wellness ben benefits, so that includes like all comprehensive health and dental. We also contribute to CPP, EI, and WCB. So those costs are significant to the county operations, so those are about $2.5 million in total. Okay, and then um, the last thing I'd like to touch on is just the, or a couple few, few more items I should say, shouldn't get ahead of myself. Uh, so the transfers to reserves, um, that we're still kind of waiting for. And the reason we're kind of waiting for that is to work in tandem with our capital budget. So 
all of those transfers in and out, uh, the transfers in are for future expenditures and the transfer out are usually for capital projects. Um, sometimes we do transfer out for operating, but we usually don't. Um, so yeah, we're just kind of just still mulling over the capital budget with council. Uh, we think we're pretty close, but we just want to just make sure that everything's on. Pretty close, but you mean eight million? <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought you were donating that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that was like one last piece we're kind of working on. And then amortization, uh, again, just for council's information, uh, our TCA policy is under section uh, 3.2 of our uh, current policies. And then also any amortization policy that the county has is also published in our uh, financial audited financial statement, which is also available on our website for public viewing as well. Um, and what that is, is that's just an estimate for administration to help us plan for the life cycle of our assets. Uh, there was also changes after the two uh, budget workshops that we held with council. Um, so that is on page uh, 107 of your agenda package. And what these are are just uh, the top four were just items that we viewed in the capital budget after uh, the operating. And then the rest are just kind of insurance updated after we received the bills. So those are just more accurate reflections. Um, I believe there is some... Um, more information on the storm drainage one coming to council at the December 17th meeting and what that is the CSMI uh, study that we're kind of working on. So there'll be more information for council. And then to budget those changes was about $98,000 that would come out of our reserve. And then um, I believe that's about it. Um, our MSI funding came in, so that's gonna help us with our capital as well. Estimates from the province. Uh, maybe I'll go through revenue as well, um, and I'll just kind of go through this from this uh, page one of six of the council package. So we we did already talk about taxation, and that is the the majority of uh, the operating budget for our revenue. Um, so I'm just going to go over user fees and recoveries. Those are going to be any like water charges, utility charges that the county has, and any miscellaneous recoveries that the county has as well. Um, the transfers, so that's transfers uh, from reserves. Um, so this is gonna be, the reason why this one's significantly higher than prior year is that uh, it says fire funding and that hasn't changed from previous year. And then it's also the funding for the WRC phase three. Um, we did make a council, a previous council resolution to loan them the funds for phase three and that still has to go through the uh, borrowing bylaw process. Uh, penalties and interest on taxes, or penalties and interest, sorry. Uh, the penalties are penalties on late tax payments, and the interest is on interest incomes from reserves. Uh, grants, similar to prior year, so we have our MSI operating that we receive annually. Uh, ASB, uh, they receive about $240,000 in grants. And then our uh, federal and provincial grants, just miscellaneous kind of throughout the year. Uh, and I believe that is about it. Um, does council have any direction that they'd like to provide administration? Um, Councillor Wilson did mention the point of reducing that uh, donation to others line under the administration tab. Um, I don't know if there's a specific amount or... And administration's, administration's thought as well, just for council's awareness, is this would be the kind of the last session for council to comment on before the passing of the interim operating budget. Um, the final will be updated with uh, updated wages and requisitions, and that will come back in April. It kind of works in tandem with our tax rate bylaw as well. And then, so our plan is to have this approved at the December 17th council meeting. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. That was very helpful. A good review. It was a way better process this time. Like, yeah. I did really enjoy the two work days. Absolutely. Any other direction regarding the interim operating budget? Is there Majority council support for reducing the donations to others? Discussion? That was some heading for committee of the whole. I'd like to still have it, committee of the whole. Watch that one out. 
for planning and priorities. Planning priorities, yeah. Now, if we cancel it off, I don't know what we're canceling on. So, Councillor Wilson, are you okay if we leave it on and we'll discuss it in planning and priorities and then? I'd like to see it reduced. At least. We haven't hit the budget, budgeted amount for the last two years, so I don't know why we need to have a discussion on not decreasing it. I'd like to see it. Down to 40 at least. What's in that again? Strathmore Field House. No. Oh, um, oh it's just the 70,000. Oh, the oh. 70,000. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, no we can't get rid of the million. <laughs> as um, much as I'd like. Um, just for Council's information as well, the actuals to date are also in. Uh, Sorry, I forget what page that was. 112. 112. That is only until September as well. So there is still ones to come in. So. Oh, 40. We'll make, you got to make them be just as fiscally responsible as we are. I'd and like to know what's involved first. That's not happening in a lot of organizations. Sure. Uh, administration really could bring back um, some yeah. information on all the State. previous expenditures from the last couple You're of years. You're talking to Handy Bus, right? Sorry. You're talking cutting down what the contribution to others uh, to other organizations line item. Yeah, I'm a, <clears throat> two twelve oh two. Yeah, I understand, and I would love to make that cut, but I just want to know what we're cutting. Yeah, I do too. Um, really, that is up to council discretion what you do cut. Um, so what I propose is that on December 17th, they'll bring back a list of what we have donated in the last two fiscal periods um, to council for review. And if council wants to pick and choose which ones they'd like to cut. Um, because And also, we don't have that new process in place yet either, how we are wanting donations uh, request at the start of every year. Um, so we, we can kind of plan around that for the next, for December 17th. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments? You need a motion? Uh, just to accept as information at this point. Shall do it. Councilor Bigger has moved. Any final discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Community and Development Services Report. Good morning, Council. Good morning. On page 165 of your agenda package, uh, is the Community and Development Services Report. <clears throat> in the report, uh, you'll note uh, within the various divisions, we have been busy, of course. Um, in community services, actually, in fact, we have started to work on the Open Space Recreation and Culture Master Plan, the engagement strategy um, therein, and how we will um, engage our community moving forward, different tactics, et cetera. Um, in the economic development portfolio, obviously we've rolled out <clears throat> the business uh, branding, uh, retention and expansion, and targeted sector focus branding. Um, with that, uh, now we will begin focusing on our internal processes. Uh, how do we uh, market? Um, how do we deliver that message to developers and interested parties uh, looking to expand, develop, um, various developments and sector development within the county. So that's quite exciting and we'll be rolling that out um, finalizing this year and into Q1 of 2020. Our GIS division uh, is busy rolling out the new GIS program. Uh, with that, um, Harry has trained our planning staff on the new system 
uh, is working with the agricultural division as well. We'll be moving to the protective services CPOs and um, public works. So obviously, as explained, that technology is utilizing uh, cross interdepartmental um, uh, across our organization and we'll be then uh, rolling it out to train councils so that you guys know what that is when we roll that out uh, to the public. Planning development and safety codes. You'll see some actuals year to date of October um, for development permits. We are uh, slightly ahead of the last two years. Uh, letters of compliance and moving into the planning uh, application, so redesignation and subdivision, um, slightly lower year to date um, than previous years. However, we still are uh, quite busy with that file intake. Um, in terms of the uh, CMRB, we're continuing to work um, in that regard with the regional growth plan, um, working and providing data uh, to the CMRB. In addition to that, <clears throat> we are rolling out, as Council is aware, our municipal development plan, our engagement strategy, um, noting that Council is in fact that steering committee and I will be getting into uh, more of an update with Council um, in the near future with regards to both the Recreation Culture Master Plan and the Municipal Development Plan and how those two will work in tandem with engaging our community and your constituents uh, moving forward. And if there's any questions, that is my report. Any questions? A motion to accept his information. Councillor Wilson has moved. All in favor? Motion is carried. There's an RFD regarding an STAB member appointment. Or two. On page 175 of your agenda package, there are two members that uh, administration is recommending reappointment for the subdivision and appeal board. Um, as council is aware, there are two-year terms. Both of these recommendations commence January 1st, 2020 and expire October 31st, 2022. Council's wishes. I'll, uh, I'll um, move the, the appointments of Elaine Dagg and uh, Mr. Tower. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. The STAB designate officer. On page 170, pardon me, 177 of your agenda package, um, there is a recommendation to approve Michelle Van Harlem, uh, who is our receptionist at the county, as a designated officer for the subdivision and appeal board. Just wanted to make a note that Michelle has taken the appropriate training and is now certified to uh, act in that appropriate role. And the intent really behind this is to remove our administrative assistant from community development services from that role to further separate the kind of conflict that is perceived. I'll move the recommendation. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Economic Development Board appointments. On page 179 of your agenda package for the Economic Development Board, we have had uh, multiple applicants, but uh, we're rolling that out as uh, due, due to the due to time. We did receive this individual uh, expressing interest with the Economic Development Board for a term expiring October 31st, 2021, as per the board's terms of reference. Council's wishes. I'll move that council approve the appointment of Simon Pierre, Karen, and Brian Martin to the uh, Woodland County Economic Development Board. Councilor Bigger has made a motion. Any questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. We have an RFD regarding CP Holiday Train. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Council. Um, on page 179 of your agenda package, there's a request for decision on the holiday train event, um, asking for a uh, contribution up to $5,000 for Wheeland County's contribution to the holiday train event, as well as uh, suspending provisions of the noise bylaw for the event. Council's wishes. Move the recommendation. Questions or discussion? Um, how much did we spend on this last year? Just, just. Uh, it was twenty five hundred. Was twenty five hundred last year? Okay. And some of that was in kind, I, or that was actual expenditures. You didn't charge for your firewood. 
I did not charge for the oh, firewood. Of course, I'm not 100% sure of the accounting, what, but that was uh, what the RFD was last year. Are we going to buy hot dogs at Strath this time? We're still exploring every option to not like to get as many donations as possible. So this will just be for contingencies for things that we can't get donated. We do have some fairly significant corporate donations already, but well, through the ch <coughs> just for my understanding, excuse me, sorry about that. When it says that a funding up to a maximum of five thousand, this funding is strictly for that process. Not because when I read down here that the. Uh, to support the Canadian the, the community food banks so that's what the donation so everybody who comes to the train event is encouraged to bring heart healthy donations for Wheatland County I, Food I was, Bank and my question is approved funding up to a maximum of 5,000 why why wouldn't we just say 5,000 what's what what dictates whether it's 3,000 or 5,000 that'll hinge on what kind of corporate donations we can get. So we're working on donations for things like the food, but we'd like to have a backup plan and just the timing of it. We don't have another council meeting. The event's on the 18th. So we only have a council is, meeting on the 17th. My question would be, why wouldn't we just approve funding for $5,000? In we, case we don't spend it all. But if like, we are you suggesting we donate the balance or? Yeah. in our community well yeah, that's fine that's it's as long as it stays within the community it's going to the food banks which mm, I'm what's the thought yeah I know <laughs> we have corporations if we have corporations willing to donate I don't want to put public funds in there so there is, the event does, uh, there's a corporate donation that comes from CP that go is, they are doing two donations this year, one to the Siksika Food. It's not a food bank, but it's a, a food security service. I believe they provide meals for people with food insecurity. And then a separate donation will be made to the Wheatland County Food Bank uh, that will go straight to, into the community from CP. As well, on the evening of the event, we collect both physical donations of food products as well as monetary donations. Uh, one of the ideas that has been being tossed around is if whether we're going to charge like a nominal fee for, say, a hot dog, or whether we might uh, exchange like a ticket for a donation. So if you bring a donation to the food bank, whether it be monetary or an actual food item, then you would get a hot dog, that kind of thing. So on, whether I'm muddle-headed or what today, but... I'm still trying to figure out what dictates. So the up to 5,000 is just, it's a discretionary fund. Uh, Dave and Patrick have been working closely with, or, and myself to a certain extent, with the organization group um, to do things like lights, uh, washroom facilities, uh, food. Uh, what are some of our other potential expenses? Entertainment. Like Entertainment. The security supplies as well like yeah ABLs security we also do have donated. my understanding last year was that the in-kind donations so our peace officers are there providing services public works provide services such as snow removal on the site um, we do traffic control um, the economic development department has been doing a lot of work uh, just to kind of showcase uh, Gleeson and our county in partnership with Siksika and the Gleeson Community Association Board who are really like also spearheading this initiative. So our challenge last year, challenge last year was we had such a short amount of time to put this together. And so this year we have a little bit more time, but we're still finding there are some gaps in uh, the funding for some of the things like food right now we don't have funded. Um, I don't think we have lights funded at this point. We do have washroom facilities, uh, refuse facility or refuse um, like a dumpster has been donated. Uh, two companies have donated washrooms, things like that. So we are, we're getting some sponsorship, but. So you're saying the last year we put in 2,500 and that didn't cover it? We anticipate it could be more this year. More we people? weren't, we weren't expecting over like 2,000 people last year. We were, in my mind, I honestly thought we'd have a few hundred based on what I've seen at other CP holiday events in much larger centers. So. 
CP has indicated that frequently your first year is smaller and then you can anticipate more attendance um, in future years. There is the factor that last year was on a Friday night, this year's on a Wednesday night, so that could play into decreased attendance or we may have increased attendance. We're also the very last stop on the holiday train um, schedule for this year, so that could increase attendance or there's a lot of unknowns, but we need to be prepared for several thousand people. Which reminds me, um, I have some numbers for food donations through Cisco and Pratt. Awesome. Thank you. And Carsland is actually getting a committee together right now for next year's CP train. And our Lions Clubs have been reached out to um, to help as well. Um, there's really a lot of kind of synergy of partnerships and people coming together to work on this. So. so I think the clearest question is that this isn't for a donation. It's just kind of a contingency plan for expenses that might not be donated. Yeah. Good questions. Is Sasika equal partners in this? Mm. They have, I haven't seen final numbers from Siksika, but they, at the second last meeting, they did indicate that they had contributions from several departments uh, from Siksika Nation. So basically from what I understand is, and this may flesh out a little bit more, but commitments that they were making financially, they were arranging the finances for. So they're making arrangements for some uh, First Nations like entertainment, um, things like that, and they would be funding those things. Things that we might be um, organizing, we would be making sure that we have funding in place for that. So they are, they have indicated that there are fairly significant financial contributions being made from Sixica. Without knowing if we're giving away hot dogs or not, or we're selling them or up to 5,000, I agree with Ben, have the 5,000 if you have money to give away hot dogs or not. It's a community event. It's uh, for the food bank, it's Christmas time. I don't mind if there's a couple thousand people there that I, I, I think. But just to say up to, and I don't know what you're spending the money on, you know, when you're all done, maybe bring back uh, yeah, what it was done. Yeah, we can bring a, bring a report you know, back. And then we can use, if we are happy enough to, or lucky enough to get it next year, we can use that as a formation of a budget. I realize that we're just starting, but we. We do also have um, Wendy Gerbrandt with Community Futures, and she's done a phenomenal job with, in partnership with our administration, in compiling like workflows and schedules, and she's compiling very formal budgets and things like that, that unfortunately we didn't have time to do last year. But all of that is much more formalized this year, so we will be able to bring that back to council for sure. So I will move that Wheatland County. Motion on the floor. Oh, sorry. Oh. Well, thank you. So are you suggesting a friendly amendment just to make it approved funding of $5,000? Is that your? Well, it makes more sense to me than, than up to, because the up to tells me that there's a, something going on in there that, that, and if there's left over, then donate it to the food bank if it needs to be done, if, if, if need be. But I know what's going on. If you did it on 2500 last year and you were happy with that last year and you're getting more donations this year and you're, you're looking for more, to me it doesn't sound like you need more than 2500 to do it again this year because it's increased. So just for a little context, so last year one of the things that we did was the main kind of part of the meal was homemade stews, um, bannock, biscuits and fry bread that was all homemade and then brought into the commercial kitchen. There, um, are some concerns about like food safety and things like that. So we're not doing that this year. So that's one of the reasons that the food cost is, could be significantly more than last year because we're planning to have kind of everything be commercially purchased and cooked on site rather than being cooked off site and brought in. How the food trucks? We are still looking at food trucks as well. 
uh, several of the food trucks that we've contacted don't run in the winter. How very? Yeah, no, we have, they have a whole network that they're reaching out to. Just some of them that we've heard back from, like emphatic no's, is that they are not equipped to run in the winter. Just, I'm not sure if it's their water lines or what, but. No, I'm not going to, it's fine that way. It's if you, if you need the five, you're going to use it anyways. It just didn't make sense to me that you, that they're on fine. Okay, there's a motion on the floor for both recommendations. The noise bylaw and the funding. Any other questions? All in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you, Dave. I'm on the next one too. The the license of occupation agreement with the Lions Club of Carsland for the digital sign that's going on the uh, Far Hall site. <coughs> And this is just to, um, as part of the agreement um, with the, the Lions Club to allow that um, sign to, to go on there and then outline all the responsibilities for each group and allowing them to, um, if they, if the county changes the purpose of that or want to sell the land, that they can get their sign off kind of thing, those type of things. So. Seems like a lot of paperwork for one small sign. You it was very say, thorough. If we need the land to move it. <laughs> well, and I should Real probably. Uh, right there. I don't know if this has anything to do with that agreement or if it will affect it at all, but we were actually misinformed at the last council meeting. It is not two sided. They couldn't afford both to have it on both sides. So they're putting it in a little uh, back further and then angling it and um, facing it a little bit northwest so because there is a resident there and we're having a meeting there thursday with them and the lions club and we'll make sure that they approve it before we go forward there's ways that and you can because uh, we have one of those we had one of those signs at aspen you can dim them at night um, and in town you wouldn't need it on all night right so we're uh, mitigating something with them um, on Thursday night. So I don't know if it has anything to do with that. Probably doesn't matter where the signs, if it's angled or not. Yeah, that, that was a little bit of a the development permit was around around the sign and what was approved at at uh, MPC. So um, that was what the concern was around that, I believe, was, was talking to Suzanne. And one of the reasons the agreement is so long is we try to do the agreement that we can use for multiple kind of items as well. So that oh, okay. if we're doing something like this, it can be it can be uh, copied for another kind okay. of thing as well, right? So try to address all the. So this can go forward. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's good. So I'll move that. Do um, you need a motion on this? Yeah, we do. Yeah, that Council Direct Reeve and Intern Chief Administration Office to sign the license of occupant agreement between Lions Club of Carsland and Wheatland County to place a digital sign on the county land. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Speargrass Community Association request. This is uh, on page 200 of the agenda package, and this is a request from the Speargrass Community Association for a water service on one of the green spaces. Council's wishes. For this water service <clears throat> being metered? I don't believe the one in Speargrass Circle is. There's already another one that's not? Yeah, there's and one right area. at my house. Oh, okay. The way you get your water? Yeah, I try to. I <laughs> can't get hoses long enough. <laughs> it's freezing. Hoses. Is there not a separate, you would know, yeah. is there not a separate irrigation system there that pumps raw water up to the golf course? Yeah, through the chair, there is an irrigation system that's operated by the, the golf course. Um, this one, uh, we don't have a lot of, of insight into that. We have, we basically, 
they release it at the, the plant and or at the pump station and it goes off. Um, this is going to be the third service uh, that Spreegrass would have. We have one in Wyndham Park. We have one up near the, the north there, and this will be the third uh, serviced uh, boulevard in that community. I can tell you it's not abused at all. It's to water the trees. Well, and I then they have that fire. With the fire. So it's worth 34000 to water trees? Yeah. I take it the, there has to be pavement cuts and things to put a service in? Yes, correct. I understand this one's a little bit more difficult than the other ones we're to put in. I will not support this. That not what the, what's that going to look like? Like a hydrant? Yeah. Or is it going to be a fire hydrant? Is there we need a fire hydrant there or do we need capability for firefighting or can we combine it or It's just uh, like a hydrant for an inch and a half kind of garden hose type water service so yard hydrant yeah like a yard hydrant yeah. and we did talk about metering it if we could do that reasonably we, we that was uh, some of the discussions we had um, with I had with Bryce on on that the other services were they put in at time of development or did we put some in after the fact for the other parks areas I understand I, I don't I don't know the history on that um, I think was the sub, did someone refuse to have? Yeah, I'm, I don't I'm know. sorry, I'm, I'm not sure the history on that either. Mike, uh, Mike. through the chair, the uh, the north one I believe was put in during construction of the de uh, development of the subdivision. The south one, actually, we had a, a water main uh, issue there that we, during time of of replacing that, we inputted that at community request, put in a, a hydrant at that time. <coughs> There's no developer down there anymore. Is that sir? There's no developer involved in no, the for the chair, the developers. He's long gone. Um, the developer is uh, not very active with that community right now. They're uh, out of province and we don't have a lot of contact. The main with them. one died. Main so. one died. Yeah. Probably needs the water right hmm. Oh, sorry. Please. Um, through the read, just for council's information, <clears throat> in the Speargrass community, these public spaces, these green spaces that were rezoned for this use, part of the challenge here is that it was rezoned and now you have a fire pit, so now we're adhering to this. This development wasn't fully built out in order to have services for these uses, partic these particular rezoned uses for these green spaces. So now we're reacting rather than, so this is part of a long process that now has to be brought to councils for council's consideration in this in this matter because there is in fact a fire pit and this is a safety measure the the biggest public concern is that safety measure obviously with the fire pit here that's okay but in the original plan this wasn't in there no we no. just rezoned these to yeah, it was migration. not that's this is way over and above what we had talked about i understand what you're saying um i have a problem with being unmetered water because um, in the Calgary Metropolitan Board, they want everything metered. That's the way it's supposed to go in the future anyways. And I re realize there's even more costs if it's going to be metered. Then somebody has to pay the bill. Um, just saying in other communities we have, do we do this anywhere else? Well, through the chair, if this is an issue brought on because they put a fire pit in there so they can sit around it and remove the fire pit, visit and do whatever they do around the fire pit. Whoever participates in that evening, could they not bring a five-gallon pail of water over and sit it down there? <laughs> a garden hose? Uh, you're not, you're not going to have firefighting capacity with, that, with what's going in there. You're going to have a garden hose. So through the Reeve, um, just to first address Deputy Reeve Classen's concern, we can get an inventory if, uh, throughout the county if this is just exclusive here or we can bring that back, uh, certainly for information. In terms of bringing a pail of so water. If we put a, one I of these at every corner, can we cancel the hall? I think what the, when I mean, you call it a green space, when you don't water the trees and the grass, or if you don't water, like I mean, we can bring this back with the cost of a meter, but if you don't water them, they're not very green. They're really not a green space. And then it's a brown space. Well, this, I think, is what 
curb funding is supposed to do. Yeah. Like this is not. It I did mean, say in there they were encouraged. They to, would be encouraged to do that to occur. I, I have a these real are problem, the asks. Real problem that, for us to put this into. These are the asks yeah. that we have to start putting into process. Yeah, it says yep. administration has <coughs> encouraged the SCA to apply for community enhancement regional board funds if the project was a priority for the community. <coughs> As I said, I will not support this motion. Where I'm considering it is from the public safety perspective with the fire pit. I think right in our own fire, one of our brochures, it recommends you have like <coughs> a hose with water if you're having a, I think that's in our fire pit pamphlet I believe yes it is and I've just asked um, Dave to comment on the fire pit build out what what is the fire pit is it interlocking can you please describe that as well that that infrastructure to council yeah the it's interlocking pavers and it's about a 30 30 foot diameter it's quite a large break like um, for I know the community has some issues around fire safety on it, but if you look at it from from the fire break of that much patio block, like you never see anything like on a fire pit anywhere else that would have that much that much uh, fire break on that patio, right? So it is quite a ways. Not saying it couldn't happen a spark when it's dry and the winds we get in like spear grass. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen, but I'd say the it's also landlocked around because um, there's there's paved roads around it, so it's just that one green space. I I can't see the fire jumping if it was a grass fire. The grass is short because it's mowed as well, right? So, fire. were you here in 2017? <laughs> <laughs> the day after we were all yeah. elected. I'm through the chair. I'm just thinking of <clears throat> different campgrounds that we go through or go to uh, where they have similar green spaces in between on the public areas. And they have uh, fire pits, and they've only got three or four feet of uh, rock outside the fire pit to the grass. And there is nothing close to them as far as a hydrant, unless it's over by where one of the trailers is sitting. Yep. Like there's and there's no safety issue there. So why was there? Why is there a safety issue here? If there is a safety issue here, then it should have been addressed when the fire pit was put in. Right. I don't see the need for it myself. But. And just through the reeve, the, the predominant safety issue <coughs> concern is just as uh, Dave had mentioned, it's being landlocked or there's single detached dwellings and, and just the design and the built form around it in order to have the highest mitigation factor for fire and for those issues. Um, this is a suggestion and a best practice. Um, that being said, I mean, we do, as the Reeve mentioned, we do mention it in our pamphlets um, for those safety measures. But again, it is at the discretion of, of council on how you wish to proceed with this one. Well, let's bring it to a vote then. Um, council, I move that council approve the request for Speargrass Community Association for a water service fee amount of $34,000 to be included in the 2020 capital budget. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion is defeated. Pretty good now, guys. Now we're sexist. <laughs> what? A subdivision time extension request. On page 204 of the agenda package, you have a uh, request for a first time extension. Uh, from the developer to extend the conditional subdivision uh, conditional subdivision <laughs> approval for 12 months. So this is the first time that they're requesting it. Below in the key issues and concepts defined, you'll see a uh, quite an exhaustive history of this file. Um, so it was put before with the conditions were appealed before the municipal government board back in 2018. Um, and subsequent to that, um, it had been brought before the commission for, um, for approval. Uh, so the applicant did not like, obviously, the conditions, so they did appeal them. However, uh, it was brought back to our attention uh, earlier this summer. Um, it's brought back to staff's attention, and now we have been mitigating it. So we are working with the developer. Uh, it's, it's quite a, 
uh, a solid relationship at this point. So uh, for council's ease, um, most of the items have been completed or the developer slash applicant is now willing to complete them. So we have mitigated any appeals at this point, which is a very positive from an administration and staff perspective. So this extension will just help uh, that applicant, that developer, um, uh, complete those uh, outstanding conditional items. So when you say that, all what I was reading this the other day, and going through here, it's, all I could see was incomplete, incomplete, and I think that's all completed. Due to the time of submission of this, there has been a lot of headway. Um, so there have been um, several completed items, but for council's ease, uh, the applicant slash developer is more than willing to complete all of those with this time extension. Um, I'd say the relationship is, is very good between um, our staff and, that, and the applicant in moving forward. We've mitigated another municipal government board appeal, um, so that is a huge win. I'll move that council choose option one to approve a subdivision time extension requested for the subdivision applicant WCAR 10 dash 022 for a period of 12 months based on the information provided in the request for a decision. Questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Transportation and Agriculture Report. Good morning. Morning, Council. Morning, Mike. Okay, you'll see uh, on page 211 the transportation and ag uh, report for November. Uh, so basically, just some highlights on this report. We, uh, majority of the crews are finished for the season, um, either. Uh, laid off or on to other duties. Uh, we still have a number of employees on that are, are completing. We have two bridge files um, down on Township 230 that we're hoping to get done by the end of the, the month here. Um, we also have uh, awarded a, a contract for a directional drill culvert to be installed by the end of the month, just on uh, just north and, and west of, of Hammer Hill, basically, um, it's a small culvert but it's a tricky location to get to so we opted to directional drill it rather than open cut uh, install that so that should be done by the end of the month um, uh, basically the other remaining members of the crew are out stripping gravel pits to get ready for next year's crushing program and uh, ASB staff is at in-service training for the majority of this week so those are some highlights uh, I'm able to answer questions if you have any any questions? I am going to send you an email with a culvert issue. It looks like a greater wing grabbed it. Okay. And uh, would be my guess. And it's right at the edge of the road. It's kind of broke off. So okay. somebody drops a tire in there and it's the tire's going to be gone. Yeah. No, that'd be great. Any other questions? I have a. <coughs> I have one, I'll, but I think I'll talk to you after about it. It's off of a, off the 564. It's an intersection, so it'll, it'll be an issue that you have to take to transportation, I think, uh, up by uh, four miles east of the 56 on the 564. The turn on to a side road. Well, I'll explain it to you after that the, if it, it's just a request to the transportation that they have to, they might have to look at that and put some signs up. I'll just okay. explain that to you after. Any other questions? Uh, I think ever since I was in here, I complained about Highway 21 and the maintenance in the winter time going up that hill. Yeah. It's only been one or two snowstorms, but what an improvement having that those plows go straight through. So if you ever get a chance talking to, is it? Darren, that is our, is that his road or? Uh, the regional director. That's regional right. director, if you happen to see him, yeah. and I forget about it, compliment him on, on, on that for sure. 
because it's made a big difference. If we can just get the Rocky Ford Road on the same schedule, yeah, right. we, we'd be away, but uh, yeah. They were 56 all the way from Drumheller up. Instead of being on two different things. Yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. 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 That's definitely a good plan. I will be asked this. I, uh, we talked about a Karen Hill community sign on 817, but because it's part of AT, that you have to like, um, so do we have a timeline? On yeah, um, through the chair and update, uh, Councilor Eichert's speaking a, a request for a uh, directional sign for the Karen Hill Community Hall. Um, so we have put that request into Alberta Transportation. Um, of course, is a, a long process we have to follow to to get that uh, through, but it is in progression right now. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mike, how about the train? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, train through, the, through the chair, the request uh, for the train whistle cessation through Carsland. I actually had a long conversation with the, the fellow, um, I guess last week, uh, end of last week. He's done an initial review of the site. Um, does have some concerns with uh, some of the sight lines, uh, mainly, primarily the, the location of that siding um, to the west and the stacking of the trains that can occur there. He thinks that might become an issue um, when we make an application here, but they're gonna do, go, they were gonna go out this week and do another analysis of it and, and have a few more of his fellows, uh, of his group look at okay. it and, and come back with a recommendation. So, nice. so we're, we're starting it off here. So <laughs> hopefully we can uh, move forward on it. Anything further? Motion to accept. Deputy Reeve Claussen has moved to accept his information. Any further discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. There's an RFD regarding a sale of county land. Okay, uh, through the chair, this uh, request is for the um, <clears throat> twofold, both the uh, uh, decision on the request or the offer that's been made as well as a direction for council to uh, put forward a uh, advertisement for the sale of this. Uh, so this is regarding a, a portion of land that the county's owned, I think for 60 some Long years. Time. What's that? Long time. Long time, yeah, that's right. Uh, it was a former sand pit uh, that we own just east and uh, east of highway number one here. Um, it's uh, been reclaimed about four or five years ago and uh, the, the farmer, the landowner has been uh, uh, utilizing it, farming it uh, currently. Uh, so that same landowner, now that we have the reclamation certificate, has made an offer to purchase on it. Um, we received that offer a couple weeks ago. The offer is below market value, so um, I actually removed a lot of the details on this uh, RFD because uh, to not alter, to not jeopardize any future bids on it. Um, so my recommendation here is to uh, refuse the, the offer on here. That landowner does have right of first refusal on any future offers, uh, but to go through the proper tender process of this land, put it out for tender, receive bids, and then if that, that landowner would be offered the, the chance to match any the highest bid. And that being said, I just would like to reiterate reiterate points I've made in the past that if he wouldn't want to buy it, can we make sure that the first right of refusal or make sure the second right of refusal? There's not one such thing, but make sure that the adjacent, adjacents have chance because I don't that want that policy amended I don't it was I don't want to see I, I don't want to see an acreage to be quite honest I'll be blunt I don't want to see an acreage owner going by the 40 acres and turn good farmland into another acreage in the middle of nowhere I'd rather see uh, adjacent farmer have a chance to purchase it if the we amended a policy but that might have just been about leasing. Just tenant, tenant, tenants renting Leasing? Leasing. Leasing, yeah. yeah I'll be my, my apologies, I don't, I don't have the policy uh, easily accessible here, but... Um, well, what happens if he's putting an intensive livestock operation on it? Okay. 
Well, it's, he has to buy it as somebody else, something different. Like, I could buy that, and you could think I'm just going to put an acreage out there, but I could be putting an intensive livestock operation or a, a huge greenhouse for my roses. Or some cows. Yeah. So, Mike, is there a... I don't forgive me, that. I don't know if I read it. What's the timing on this? Uh, like, would we have time to review the policy on tendering? Oh, uh, through the chair, for sure. Um, this uh, request just had come in. There's no uh, deadlines on on uh, uh, this application or this proposal right now. There is no deadlines, but however, if as a farmer, I'd want to know if I can buy land. No, I'm just saying perhaps, like, philosophically, we need to review the policy first yeah. and then consider this so long as it's after we've like independently, con like, not consider the policy in terms of this, but just... Consider our policy in general and make sure it aligns with our priorities for sale of county land. We, through the chair, we have to be careful how we can't dictate what happens when you sell land. And uh, the owner, the, the fellow that's leasing it, if he at once first, if we give him right of first refusal, I don't have an issue with that. But to try and put a condition on there, if I'm a farmer, I can buy it and you'd be happy, and then next year I'd apply for a subdivision. So you can't put those, you, I, I can't, I don't think we, we can put those kind of conditions on it. You, first tender doesn't want it, then it's, and you want to sell it, then you sell it to the, and uh, you bid, you, either that or you don't sell it. You control it by the lease, but you don't control it by the sale of it. Um, just to the chair, we're, we can pull up that land policy for councils. Yeah. Uh, That'd be great. Right now. Well, the MGA states too, we can't sell for any less, less than appraised value. Mm -hmm. So The only is, question I'm the hearing is just about it? prioritizing it to adjacent landowners with the possibility of that preserving the agricultural use of the land, potentially more so than not prioritizing adjacent landowners. But I'm not sure that we can do that under the MGA either. Nope. But you can't stop if it's an adjacent landowner buys it. He has all the right. No, and that's why I just said may increase the likelihood yeah. of continuing the agricultural use. I'm the young guy that doesn't want to get government in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't want that. Just let whoever buy it buy it. So you. Nimby. Yeah. Right of first refusal, I'll give them, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I guess we can consider this application right now. I'll move that council not accept the right of and, and uh, direct to tender the sale. Mm -hmm. As proposed. As proposed. As outlined in the RFD? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Questions or discussion? Um, so you're putting it up for sale. Are you giving the leaseholder the, the right to match the, 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 the right of first refusal? Yeah. Right of first That's refusal. inherent, I think, in the agreement. Any questions or further discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. Just a comment. When we uh, did some of the railway lines and stuff, we put a condition on the sale that it had to be returned to title. So then a tender process, but as soon as you put that condition on, Pretty well makes the land worthless. I mean, think about who's going to buy it if it has to go to the, back to title. It had, it, yeah. The, there was more condition to it than just that. It was the, the condition on it was that if the, the it, it had to be put back to title, or we or we kept it. That was a yeah. whoever bought it. It had to go back to title. So it was, and the, and the land was sold for less than fair market value at that because of that. Yeah. So. Because that affected the market value. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's three pieces of correspondence. A letter from CN Rail, Corporate Services, outlining some work that they're doing with our administration. A letter from Village of Hazar, thanking for the CRISP funding. And a letter from 
the Hazar Agricultural, Hazar and District Agricultural Society. I did email council. I had an opportunity to chat with Kyle Gordon, president of the Hazar and District Ag Society, just to get a little bit more detail. Sorry, I'll just pull up the email so that I'm accurate. They've sent this out to all the, all the groups in the community. Yeah, he said they've sent it out extensively. They're hoping for a couple of grants, and they're <clears throat> when I was talking to them the other night, they figured they might be short about 80,000. 80, 80, I think it's one, between 80 and 100,000. My question to him, because we've done it before, was that the... Uh, for this uh, uh, curb funding, that what they approached the other, and they hadn't done that yet, approached the other groups that are also applying for it. And uh, they all apply for it with the idea in mind that that's where, we've done that before with the arena, when they got all got together and put money in to build the arena. So, And he said, well, we hadn't done that yet. I said, well, we should maybe yep. set that up first. So. Yeah, absolutely, and I sent him the link to all of the curb information. And as well, he had an inquiry they have, the Masons may be willing to donate, but the Egg Society isn't, can't issue charitable uh, receipts. But uh, CAO Henderson indicated that the county could do that, um, like what we had discussed for Carsland. Um, so I let him know that. And yeah, he did say that they just aren't solid on an ask um, because they have letters out to all the organizations in it because of the significant number of grants that they've applied for and not heard back from yet. I did ask um, if rather than like a donation, they might consider requesting a loan um, if there is a shortfall and he said they'd be happy to look at that. So I think he also said that they're willing to come to council and uh, meet with us and kind of outline the project more and what their request might be. So I think at this point we could just accept this as information and see what comes forward. They are hoping to do the repairs next winter or sorry, the next summer so that they can be, they're in operation now and so they could be in operation next winter as well. I'll move to accept it as information for now. Do you want to move all the correspondence? Yeah. Any further questions or discussion? All in favor? Motion is carried. We will break for lunch and reconvene and move into closed session. Okay, I'll just stop the recording. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs>